Hey all, I'm Hosanna Barrett, and my research is on Conoidiocrella luterostrata, a potential biocontrol of elongate hemlock scale in the eastern United States. I worked on this project in the Casson lab in the WVU Division of Plant and Soil Sciences. This research is funded by the Christmas Tree Promotion Board, Grant 2010 WVU, and my research was made possible by the WVU SURE program and the WVU Honors Capstone program in biology. So I'm going to start by introducing you to the topics that are involved in this research, and then we'll go ahead and get into methods and results. Elongate hemlock scales, which I'm going to call EHS throughout the presentation, are an invasive insect pest of hemlock, fir, spruce, and pine trees, including trees on Christmas tree farms. They can cause symptoms, including needle yellowing and needle drop. You can see a little bit of that in this figure right here. These insects are also an issue for Christmas tree farmers because the adult females are permanently attached to the needle. So you can see in the image at the bottom here, the adult females are pretty visible on the needle, especially when the infestation is heavier like it is here. And this can be an issue when farmers are trying to sell their trees because trees with visible insects on them are usually not very desirable. And also because there are some restrictions about transporting trees with visible insects on them between states. And in the inset here is just a zoom in so you can see what the adult females look like on the needle. These insects were first observed in the United States in New York State in 1908 on Japanese hemlock trees and have since spread throughout the eastern United States. This map shows the range as of 2020 from multiple sources. EHS adult females are permanently attached to the needle and covered in a brown waxy covering called the test. The females lay their eggs underneath the test, and throughout the spring, the eggs hatch into the crawler stage. Crawlers are not protected by a waxy coating at first, and are thus particularly vulnerable to control efforts. After a few days, the crawlers settle onto the needles and gradually become covered in a protective covering, whether it's the adult female test or a protective covering under which the males mature. And the goal of this project is to develop natural fungal pathogens of the invasive Christmas tree pest along a hemlock scale in the Eastern United States as biocontrol agents. So just to introduce to the concept of a biocontrol agent, that's a living thing, whether it's an insect, a fungus, or something else, which naturally preys on the targeted pest and which is purposefully applied to the pest to reduce its numbers. So in agriculture, we use a technique called integrated pest management, where we apply a variety of treatments to provide flexible control for a pest. So we might apply biocontrol agents and chemical pesticides, and we might also use different farming techniques. This approach is beneficial because it's flexible and you can adapt it to new challenges because of these multiple factors that can be tweaked. So by developing a biocontrol agent for elongate hemlock scales, We'll be increasing the tools that farmers have to manage these pests in a... So now getting into the methods of the research that I did on this project. It started with the isolation and identification of CL, or Conoidiocrella luterostrata, the fungus that we talked about at the beginning. So CL was found on elongate hemlock scale crawlers at various sites in Ash County, North Carolina, and Grayson County, Virginia. And the fungus was collected and also branches that had crawlers on them, but no fungus and branches that did not have any elongate hemlock scale were collected. You can see it infecting the crawlers right here. You can see these orangish lumps, which are the fungus on the crawlers. And again, the crawlers are very small. So this is pretty small, but because of the bright orange color, they were very visible. So what I did is I scraped the crawler with the fungus off it off of the needle and I put it onto a plate with a nutrient media that the fungus can grow on. And over here, we're just seeing some of the cultures of the fungus that we grew. So once the fungus was cultured, it was molecularly identified as Conoidiocrella luterostrata. Elongate hemlock scales in the nymph and adult female stages on hemlock branches were tested to see if this fungus could infect them. We dipped needles that had nymph and adult elongate hemlock scales into a solution of C. luterostrata spores in 0.01% tween. And tween is just a detergent that we used 
to suspend the spores and to help the spores uh, break up, break the surface tension and really cover the insects and the needles. Um, and then we observed symptoms and mortality in the treatments by going through them daily and for two weeks and observing any symptoms or mortality that we saw in recording that. Several of the treatments were conducted to optimize our protocol. So there were some difficulties with the bioassays. Elongate hemlock scales have not been maintained in the lab very much. So there isn't really a protocol that we could go to from the literature to figure out how to do this. So we had to work from a lot of trial and error. And I wanted to get into this here a little bit just because that's a big part of research. And I'm sure something that a lot of us experienced in our summer research was some trial and error trying to get things right. So first, what we tried is taking branches that had elongate hemlock scale at all life stages and dipping them in the solution and maintaining them and counting the mortality. And that was very difficult. You can see this first graph, we're trying to count the mortality of the crawlers, but throughout the treatment, more and more eggs are hatching. So the number of crawlers is increasing. And then crawlers are also settling. So at other times, the number of crawlers is decreasing. And that makes it very difficult to interpret the data. So what we did to solve that problem is we moved a set number of crawlers to a new container where there weren't any other elongate hemlock scales to try to repeat the process without that complication. And what we want to get is something like this right here. This is just an example of what a survival curve would look like. So normally the insects are gonna continue to die over time. So it's gonna keep going down, but the curve should not go back up because that's gonna indicate either hatching like we saw or some sort of miraculous revival of dead elongate hemlock scales, which is would definitely be a significant development. But I think we can safely say that that's not what's happening in our bioassays. So in the next treatment, we had the elongate hemlock scales in a container on their own, along with some branches of. Um, and so we were trying to count the mortality of the crawlers over time, but the crawlers are very small and they move around the plate. And also once they die, they tend to dry up and that they're even smaller. So it was difficult to ensure that we were counting all of the same crawlers every day. Um, so you can see here, the curve doesn't look smooth like a normal survival curve. We have it going down and then we have it coming back up. So we have this miraculous revival of crawlers that we do not want to see. Um, so we're still working on optimizing our protocol. We've gotten some very promising early results, which I'll get into in a minute, but we're still working on getting this bioassay right so that we can really see like what percent of the crawlers are being killed by this treatment. And another issue that we just recently figured out is that we were storing our bioassays in a grow room, which is about 30 degrees Celsius. Um, and we tried growing the fungus in this grow room and then also growing it in the lab in a cabinet, which is about 21 degrees Celsius. And just visually comparing the growth here over the same period of time. Um, this is showing the growth is significantly higher in the lab than it is in that grow room. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and get into the results of our experiments. So first of all, when we identified our fungus, we did it by sequencing a couple of genes. And for one of the genes that we sequenced, elongation factor one alpha, we were able to align it with other sequences that other researchers had dropped into a database. We see our sequences right in the middle here. These are the seven isolates that we sequenced, and they all came back with their sequences being identical. And those sequences were also identical to sequences that were deposited by a team who collected this fungus in Kyoto, Japan. And then we see sequences down on the bottom here. These are sequences from Thailand, and they break off to form their own clade. So this indicates that our fungus is clonal, so it's not reproducing sexually. There's not genetic diversity in our fungus. All of the genetic sequences of all the individuals are identical, um, and that it's very closely related to fungi that are in Japan. As I mentioned we'd taken those needles that had the fungus, but also needles that just had elongate hemlock scale and needles that were clear from our sites. So we cultured fungi from those needles after sterilizing the surface. So the culture would be only a fungi that were growing inside the needle. And that would be the fungal microbiome of the needle is what we would call it. So we looked at all of the culturable fungi that were growing inside these needles. 
And you can see them compared here. Um, there were some interesting differences, but the most significant thing is that our fungus was not found growing in the needles. And this is important because another fungus that infects elongate hemlock scale is an obligate needle endophyte, Colococcium perenniae. So it does grow inside the needles. And it's, it's preferable for the fungus's life cycle to rely on the insect so that we know that it's not gonna have any kind of an effect on the trees that we don't want. So from our bioassays, I mentioned we had some promising results. So something that was really important is that we took crawlers to three weeks after they had been treated with spores of CL. We took them out of the bioassay and we sterilized the surface of the crawler so that we were just looking again at fungi that were growing inside it. And we cultured CL from the crawlers. So you can see here, I'm comparing a culture that we know is Conoidiocrella luterostrata with the culture from our bioassay, comparing the morphology. And then over here, I'm comparing the spores. So they have the similar rice grain shaped spores that we know from our CL. So there's several more steps to this project. Some big things are to continue optimizing the bioassays with the elongate hemlock scale. And because crawlers emerge in the summer, that window is kind of closing. So crawlers won't be as available to us in a few months. But we're also planning to conduct bioassays with greenhouse whiteflies or Trelonius vaporium, which are also, we know they can be infected by this fungus. It's been observed by researchers in Thailand. And they are more commonly maintained in the lab. So it'll be easier for us to find protocols for how to maintain them and for how to use them in a bioassay. And another thing we wanna do is observe the morphology and genetics of CL. So we wanna look at more isolates and see if the genetic sequences of other isolates are identical and also to sequence more genes so that we can compare them to more sequences from around the world. And we wanna get more detailed look at the morphology. So we're gonna do things like measure the spores and observe the growth at different temperatures so that we can really characterize what the population of CL in the United States is like. Thank you for coming to my talk and I'll be really happy to answer any questions you might have.